Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Christopher Thompson, one of the co-directors for the Monsignor Terrence Murphy Institute for Catholic Thought, Law, and Public Policy. Brand new in the role, so I'm very happy to be here and serving the St. Thomas community in this important project. Murphy Institute is committed to sustained, uh, deep reflection on the common good and the implications of our Catholic Christian witness in public life. And perhaps nowhere does that uh, come to a head more poignantly than in the discussion of food, which we all share in common, uh, despite our inclinations and interest in political uh, uh, differences. We all come to the table eventually and eat uh, at one point or another. And so we thought, well, that's going to be a good idea to have an evening of conversation uh, about food. Then we thought it would be an even better idea if we had a brilliant speaker to, to lead us in our own reflection. And Dr. Norman Wirtha has agreed to join us, and we're so edified. This is my first encounter with Dr. Wirtha, and frankly, I'm struck by the number of people I've met tonight who are here because of Dr. Wirtha. So that, that's very, very impressive. I'm so happy. I take a lot of satisfaction of the fact that uh, a little bit of a diverse group is coming together tonight from, from Bethel and from the University of Minnesota and the University of St. Thomas Law School, School of Divinity, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm really happy about that. This afternoon we had a, a little session with graduate students um, from Ag Program at the University of Minnesota, from our own theology department, from our own Catholic studies. This conversation of the relationship of the care of creation and our, and our Christian uh, Catholic intellectual tradition is, is vital and, and, and frankly a little underdeveloped at this point. Thanks to Laudato Si, the Holy Father has asked us to give more directed attention to this question. I'm honored to make a small contribution tonight along that line. We have three distinguished panelists. Uh, I will make a little bit more extended introduction uh, as, as, uh, after Norman's presentation. But the first would be Jim Innes, Director of Catholic Rural Life, uh, national organization uh, located here now at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, Jim's been a longtime uh, servant and leader in the integration of Catholic social teaching and agricultural practice. Elise Amel, Director of Sustainability at the University of St. Thomas, a relatively new uh, project here. Uh, I said that the Catholic community was a little maybe behind, and, and that would be my first uh, point is to say We've just uh, embarked on uh, rather vigorous in, uh, discussion and engagement with issues of sustainability, so I'm especially happy to have you join us. And then John Mesco, Executive Director of Midwest Organic Sustainable and Educational Services, otherwise known as MOSES, the largest uh, organization of organic growers uh, in the United States, located, uh, I think, uh, well, I, I don't know if you're located in La Crosse, but that's where their national convention is. Uh, and uh, all of these folks have crossed paths with our common work and our common effort, and um, it's just been a, a, a journey of discovery and joy as I think more deeply on these questions. I think a lot of you can resonate with that as you enter into these conversations. It can be a little overwhelming, but frankly, for the most part, it's just really intoxicating. It's so exciting in its subject and in its possibilities. So I'm especially pleased to have the evening come about. Um, if it looks like I'm reading from my phone, uh, there's a reason for that, because I'm reading from my phone. My papers I left uh, over in the other, other evening, uh, other uh, venue for our dinner, so sorry for that. Norman Wurzba pursues research and teaching interests at the intersection of theology, philosophy, ecology, agrarian, and environmental studies. He lectures frequently in Canada and the United States. His work focuses on understanding and promoting practices that, equi that can equip both rural and urban church communities to be more faithful and responsible members of creation. I, I read this bio and I think, boy, <coughs> I'm so glad he's here because if he weren't here, he'd be the one I'd, I'd love to hear. Current research is centered on a recovery of doctrine of creation and a restatement of humanity in terms of its creaturely life. Professor Wurzba has published extensively. We don't have time to go through the whole list. Uh, but titles include The Paradise of God, Renewing Religion in an Ecological Age, Living the Sabbath, Discovering the Rhythms of Rest and Delight, Way of Love, Recovering the Heart of Christianity, uh, and um, our, our World, Food, and Faith, A Theology of Eating. 
Uh, that's just some of the titles here. Uh, there's many more, and I know some of you are quite familiar with his work. I don't want to take too much more time praising him. I want to just edi uh, have an edifying evening listening to him. So let's turn to that and welcome Dr. Wurzbaum. Oh, thanks, Don. So thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, this is really great to see you. And this is my first time at University of St. Thomas. So first of all, thank you, Christopher, for having me come out here. So I want to talk about the spirituality of eating tonight. And I'm going to talk about food. And I need to tell you that when I started this project to write a book on food and theology, a number of my friends said, don't theologians have anything better to do <laughs> than to write about food? But food is powerful. If you weren't here about 10 minutes ago, Christopher made the announcement that there's some brie out there. <laughs> and it was like a stampede of people went out to get it. Right? Food is really powerful. And so I grew up farming, and food was absolutely central to our life. We are the kind of family that narrates what we do through the meals that we have. So maybe you're like that, you go on a vacation and you sort of talk about where you've been, but you talk about what you ate. And the question is, why is food so important? Why does food register in our imaginations, in our stomachs for sure, but in our hearts in really, really powerful ways? It just does. And so as I was thinking about a project that I might want to undertake, I thought, well, theologians ought to be engaging this very elemental, basic, sometimes very mundane reality. And when I looked around to see what theologians had been doing, I discovered that their interests were primarily food hunger in the world, which is a serious issue, and then arguments about vegetarianism, for or against. And that was really the extent of it. And I thought, that's it? Isn't there more for us to be talking about? And so I started to read the Bible again. I started to read different theologians. And what I discovered is that food is absolutely central to the movement of the life of faith. And I'm going to describe a little bit about how that might manifest itself. We need a lot more time to do a full treatment. But what I discovered is that my colleagues who were not thinking about food theologically that maybe one of the reasons they weren't is that they didn't have the proper orientation by which to think about food. And what I mean is this. I don't mean this as a dig at you, but do you realize that you're the most ignorant eaters the world has ever known? I mean, seriously. How many of you grow any of your own food? Oh, wow, you're so unusual. <laughs> Do you realize that throughout most of human history, I'm talking like 99.9% .9 of human history, people have been intimately embodied ways related to their food production. We're unusual because the way we get food is we shop for it. And the shopping relationship to food is the most naive relationship possible. And what this has meant is, and I'm not saying you all are malicious about this, okay, or that you're lazy. It's a feature of the world that we live in because we have said for a good long while, especially in this country, that farming is a life that is not worthy of the human being, which has got a lot of problems if you think about that seriously. So we think that we're living a liberated, emancipated, modern, contemporary life because we don't grow our own food. And I want to suggest to you that that has done so much damage to the human imagination. It's done so much to get us to think that human beings can somehow live separate from the realities of land, the realities of water, animals, plants, weather. And nothing could be further from the truth about us. And so this imagination that we have has filtered into the ways we think about food. I know that a lot of us as shoppers of food still think about food a lot because we get hungry, sometimes more than three times a day. But when we think about what imagination brings us to the food, you discover that it's a radically shrunken imagination because the food that we buy in a store comes to us 
cut off entirely from its histories of growth and death, cut off from the long list of creaturely lives and deaths that feed into its very possibility. And so I want to start with just a little exercise to get your imaginations primed to think a little bit more expansively. So let's start with a piece of apple pie. We'll make it a la mode, too. All right? What's a piece of pie? Think about it. What had to happen for there to be such a thing called apple pie? It ought to blow your mind, people, because you know what apple pie tastes like. It is so good. But how do you get it? Well, we'll start with apples. How do you get apples? Well, you got to have trees. Any of you tried to grow apples? How many, uh, how many years do you get really good apples? And how much poison do you have to use? It's tricky. But you got to think about the tree. You got to think about what the tree is doing. How does a tree grow? You think about soil. I love to think about soil. Hans Jenny, one of the great soil scientists of the last century, said, after spending 60 years studying soil, at the end of my life, I still think it's a profound mystery and I don't know what it is. Is it alive? Is it dead? Don't know. Is it organic? Is it inorganic? Is it an organism? He says, we just don't know. Because we have not spent hardly any of our time scientifically thinking about soil because we think all the cool stuff is above ground, when in fact all the cool stuff is below ground. Do you realize that there are billions of species of microorganisms alive in the soil? And if it wasn't for the complexity of the life in the soil, as Walt Whitman said, we'd all be overcome by the stench of death because everything above ground dies. Where does the death go? It goes into the ground. But it doesn't just go into the ground. The ground receives the death and transforms death into new possibility, which is why Wendell Berry said the soil is Christ-like in its beneficence. It's the site of resurrection. But we don't think about soil that way because it's just, it's just dirt, right? We wash it off ourselves because we don't want to be dirty. I used to eat dirt as a kid. I thought it was cool. And good farmers, they can taste the dirt and tell you what's going on. If there isn't soil, nothing else for us is going to happen. No apple pie. That's sad. So it all starts with soil. But then you've got to have plants. Think about just a single rye plant. Put it in the ground. Let the seed go into the ground. Let it germinate. And in the course of two or three months, that rye plant will send roughly 600 miles of roots and fibers into the soil. Did you hear that? I think it was a PhD student at the University of Minnesota had a grant to, to measure all those 600 <laughs> miles. But if you add all the hairs and filaments, the number grows dramatically. What's going on? What is this plant doing in the soil? It's having a relationship. It's having conversations. They're chemical conversations. But as that root system extends into the soil, you've got the communication which makes possible a healthy rye plant. Think about a tree now. What are we learning about trees, people? It's astounding. Trees are communities. They send thousands of miles of roots into the ground. Because if they don't do that, they're not going to be healthy. So having an apple tree in the ground is no small thing. Because as that tree communicates with the soil, it doesn't just suck nutrients out. It takes sunshine and transforms sunshine into sugars that it sends down 
into the soil, into the roots that feed the microorganisms. And when all of this is working really well, you get fabulous apples that then can go into the pie. So what happens after you've got apples? Well, you've got to make a pie crust. How many of you know how to make pie crust? It's really hard. If you make a good one, I'm coming to your house. <laughs> Lard, yeah. <laughs> we can't say that, though, can we? Butter. Right? you got to have wheat fields to make possible the flour. And then you got to have butter. How do you have butter? Cows. I love cows. You know why? Well, lots of reasons. They have a rumen. You don't have a rumen. I don't think any of you have a rumen, right? Because if you did, you could eat grass. It's astounding. We can't eat grass, but cows can. And if you treat a cow right, it'll produce milk that'll make the butter, that'll make the a la mode for a long time. You should all love your cows because they make so much in the world possible that tastes good. Aren't you astounded by the fact that you live in a world that can taste that good? You should be, because I could just as well have imagined God making a world that had no taste at all, where you didn't have to eat. Because for a lot of people, eating's a nuisance. It takes time. But when done right, it's one of the most pleasurable, memorable things that you will ever do. And God wants the world to be like that. So pie is not just a thing on your plate. Pie is a reality that takes you deep into the soil where you encounter billions and billions of microorganisms that are in relationships with each other to absorb the death above ground, to, to work with plants, to bring the energy of the sun into the ground, to make apples that then, when put together with a pie crust, and again, this is a small miracle, folks, that there were people around who said, there is a thing called pie crust that we can make. So there's the creativity of a baker. All of this is joined together so that you can have a piece of apple pie. So the question would be, how would you ever say thank you? How long would it take for you to say thank you? especially if you start to enumerate all the lives that intersect to make this thing called pi possible. Now, I can talk a lot longer about pi, but I'm going to stop because I now want to raise a very important question. Based on what I've said about pi, what is food? How would you define it? I think if you look at our culture today, the way a lot of people would want to define it is to say that food is basically a commodity, right? It's fuel. And what we most care about is that the food is available in copious quantity because we don't want food shortages, absolutely not. And we worry that maybe it's going to taste okay or maybe not really good, so we want the food to be tasty. And then, above all, we want the food to be as cheap as possible because we don't want to spend much money on it. And so typical American eaters spend less on food than any people in the history of the world. So we have this visceral reaction to food so that when Christopher says there's brie out there, we run. So we know that there's an attachment there that really resonates with us but we don't want to pay very much money for it. And the question is, what does this mean for us as people? What does it mean for farmers? What does it mean for the land? Right? These are big, important questions, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about, about some of that in the, in the break or the panel conversation. So there's that definition. Food is fuel. Food is commodity. I want to say dispense with that definition. Let me give you a better one. Food is God's love made delicious. Did you hear that? Food is God's love made delicious. You're probably thinking that is a very strange way to talk about food. 
But theologically, there's lots of reasons to talk this way. The most basic one is this. Ask yourself, why does God create a world at all? It's not because God needs to. The only reason that God creates, at least this is the best that theologians have come up with as an answer, is because God loves. God is supremely hospitable because God is the eternal host that makes room for what is not God to be. God then welcomes this reality into the divine presence, nurtures it so that this life can live into the fullness of the life that is unique to it. This is God creating as an act of hospitality. And so if things exist at all, it's because God wants them to, God loves them to, and God delights in them. And so any of the food that we are privileged to eat the only way to make sense of it is to say that it's God's love made delicious. Every creature is God's love variously made visible, fragrant, audible, tactile, or delicious. I'm not saying you should lick your neighbor or anything like that. <laughs> but this is how we need to be thinking about the world. It's not just stuff out there. It's not just commodities. Everything is a gift, and it's a gift that's communicating something about the goodness of things to be, the loveliness of things to be. And if we can't learn to delight in the goodness, the loveliness of the world God makes, we won't understand it properly. Another way to think about this is to say that food is the medium of God's love. You know from reading the Bible that God does not look favorably on a society where people go hungry. Why? Well, it's because God wants creatures to be cared for. God wants creatures to be able to live into the fullness of their lives, which is why Jesus spends so much of his ministry touching bodies, befriending bodies, healing bodies, feeding bodies. It's through feeding that we show our love for each other. Maybe you had a grandmother like mine. When I came to her house when I was younger, she always had food for me to eat. And sometimes I'd show up and I'd say, Oma, I cannot eat. I just am stuffed. And she'd say, eat. I say, I can't. And if I didn't, you know what she did? She cried. Don't ever make your grandmother cry. <laughs> it's not a good thing to do. So I ate. Now, why is she crying? I'm not just rejecting her food. I'm rejecting her love. That's what makes her cry. And if you have the experience of cooking for other people, you know what I'm talking about. Because when you cook for other people, what you are doing is you're investing your love with ingredients to make a meal so that you can give it to somebody else as the expression of your love. So when you think about eating, when you think about what food is, it's one of the primary ways that we join our love with the love at work in the world. And it's not just the eating act itself where this intersection of your love and God's love come together. It starts even earlier in the production of the food, in gardening, in farming. I want you to think for a minute about a passage in the Bible that I think we do not linger upon nearly enough. I think you all know the first creation story, the seven days, right? All this really amazing thing is, is going on. And if we had time, we could talk about it because there's so much of interest there. But I want to turn your attention to the second creation story that starts in Genesis 2. You remember, this is the Garden of Eden story. We like that story because there's nudity <laughs> and there's evil. 
And when you put those two together, that's really interesting. But you need to back it up. Because what's going on before? Right? It's the Garden of Eden. How is God presented in this story? Anybody remember? He walks with Adam, so he's a walker. What else is God doing, though? Who said that? Brilliant. God planted a garden. You need to stop to think about that. There's some debate about whether this is the older of the two creation stories in Genesis. I'm going to assume it is older because it, I just want it to be. <laughs> so this is the Israelite people communicating to each other who they believe God to be. They're living in a context where the gods around them in Mesopotamia would have all been warrior gods. Okay, These are gods who create through violence. These are gods who want your trust because you are terrified of them. And what do the Israelites come along and do? They say, oh, our God's a gardener. <laughs> right? Think about that. Why in the world would these people have said God is the gardener, the eternal gardener, the primordial gardener, the most important gardener? Because if you were to walk into the Garden of Eden, say you're there that first day, and you get to watch what God does. Well, first of all, Karl Chapek, a Czechoslovakian writer, says he would have found God on God's knees, hands in the dirt, holding it close to God's mouth and kissing it. Because if you're a serious gardener, you want to kiss the soil. And what does this gardening God do? Breathes into the soil so that the first human being, Adam, is coming out of Arama. This is incredible, folks. And then we're told God does the same thing with the other creatures. The plants, the animals, the birds, they all come out of the ground. You are soil made alive by God's breath inside of you, moving through you. And so the love of God it's not just a hospitable love, it's a gardening love, which is a love that is constantly attentive, vigilant, protecting, nurturing, weeding. I need weeding. This is an incredible vision because it's communicating something about how human beings, if they're going to live into the fullness of their lives, they need to somehow participate in God's gardening ways with the world, which is why in Genesis, this first Adam is told to do what? Till and keep the garden. Okay, We want to read that verse and say, yeah, this is a divine punishment. No, there is no punishment here at all. The fall has not yet happened, people. So the command to till and keep the garden is not an invitation to drudgery. It's not a reflection of some primordial wrongdoing on the part of Adam. Adam's invitation to garden is to participate in God's ways of being because it's through gardening that we understand the world. It's through gardening that we understand the world's fragility. It's through gardening that we understand that every living thing needs our nurture, attention, respect. And it's through gardening that we eat in a way that isn't naive. And God is saying, I need you to learn how to garden so you can learn to live properly in this world with each other. That's astounding. Because it's a fundamental description about how human beings need to learn the love of gardening so they can learn to love like God loves. I don't imagine many of you were told that when you were growing up. I grew up in a church full of farmers. I never once heard a sermon about God the gardener or God the farmer. But it's all over Scripture. You all know Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd. Well, in our culture, we may think, well, that's kind of cute. But what's being communicated here except that God's way of being with the world is in this very practical, mundane work of caring for creaturely life. 
As Christians, we have a number of rites, traditions. One of the most important is, of course, the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, depending on the tradition that you come from. And sometimes when I talk about these things, people say, well, you always talk about the Old Testament. No, no, no. Christians have all sorts of ways to talk about this. And the Eucharist is one of the primary ways because I would argue that the Eucharist is actually a continuation of God the Garden themes. But I want to talk about it a slightly different way. So I'm guessing that you all know John chapter 6. It's a passage that starts out with Jesus feeding 5,000 people. It's a pretty amazing story, right? They're out on a grassy plain, and they've been there a long, long time, and the people are hungry. And so the disciples say to Jesus, just send them all home so they can go get food to eat because they're hungry. And Jesus says, no, it's not what we're going to do. And Jesus says, what do we have? And they look around, and there's this boy who's got some food. And this boy had a very good mama because she provided food for him, not just for himself, but to share. And you could argue Jesus understands this hospitality in the mom and is going to pick up on that hospitality by providing food for everybody. It's an amazing story. And the people clearly are astounded. And we're told that they rushed upon him to make him king. And that makes perfect sense, because if you're living in a culture like these people were, that are more or less known or on intimate terms with hunger, if you can get somebody who's going to be your king who can have food available on demand, I'll vote for that guy. But Jesus says, that's not who I am. I'm not your grocer. Instead, Jesus says something really puzzling, remarkable, to some of the Jews, disgusting. Because he says, I am the bread of life. And unless you eat me, you have no life in you. It sounds like cannibalism, doesn't it? But Jesus goes on to explain what he means. He says, I need to abide in you and you need to abide in me because if you don't, you're not going to know what real life is. And what is Jesus' life? Well, it's an extension of the gardening life, isn't it? Tending to the lives of others, nurturing the lives of others, protecting the lives of others, healing the lives of others. And so Jesus says, if you're going to have anything like real life, you have to learn to be on the most intimate terms with me imaginable. And what could be more intimate than to actually eat Jesus? Because when you eat, you take the life of another inside of yourself. It becomes incorporated into your life. So that Jesus, who now becomes your food, makes it possible for you to be food for others. Theologians throughout the ages have wondered about what, what kind of bread is this? Because if I go to the store or if I bake some bread, the bread that I put into me, it dissolves. And they said, well, Jesus clearly isn't that kind of bread. And they said, no, Jesus is the living bread of life, which means that Jesus, upon entering into you, remains inside of you so as to transform you from within and transform you at the most visceral level, your gut. And so the source of power, the inspiration for your life, now comes from Jesus who lives inside of you. And Jesus makes possible for us to live in the world in a new sort of way which is why for Christians the Eucharist is such an important element in their life of faith. The Eucharist is the, the regular sort of taking in of Jesus so that we can live the transformed life that he makes possible for us. And what's very clear is that as early Christians started to think about what kind of a life are they going to live subsequent to Jesus' departure, 
eating had to become a vital part of that. So if you look at the book of Acts, Peter, you remember, one of the leaders of the church, he's Jewish. You're not supposed to eat with Gentiles. Okay, so you're not supposed to do that. It's just wrong. And what God does is God gives Peter a vision. A sheet descends from heaven with all these different animals on it. And God says to Peter, you can eat it all. And because Peter is a slow learner, like we are, God has to show the vision three times. But without that vision, Peter would not have been able to eat with Cornelius. And if Peter had not been able to eat with Cornelius, right, just think about this. If the Jewish Christians, right, Jesus was a Jew, remember? If the Jewish Christians had not learned to eat with Gentiles, we wouldn't exist, people. And interestingly, the Bible makes it very clear that the opening to the possibility of life with each other depends upon us being hospitable with others, with everybody. So here, eating becomes the device by which something like reconciliation with strangers, reconciliation with foreigners, reconciliation with those who are despised others is going to be possible. Remember, Jesus ate with people you're not supposed to eat with. So with Christianity, you see then how eating is taken into the heart of the movement of its life so that people can now live in a reconciled relationship with each other, in merciful, loving ways with each other. And I would argue that it's not just that Christians are invited to live in reconciled relationship with each other as people, but that we're supposed to live in a reconciled relationship with the whole of creation. And I'll just give you one passage to think about here. In the letter to the Colossians, we have what's called the Christ hymn. Very famous passage. Biblical scholars have spent a lot of time trying to understand what's really going on here. And many of them have concluded that this was a passage in which Christians gave a kind of summary declaration of who they believed Jesus was. Because if you were wanting to tell people why you're a Christian, you have to be able to give them a, like a two-minute elevator speech. This is even shorter than two minutes. But in this passage, some remarkable things are happening, right? We're told there that Jesus is the image or icon of the invisible God, that through Jesus all things came to be, through Jesus all things hold together, and that through the blood of his cross, God was reconciling to God's self all things in heaven and on earth. Ask yourself, if you're trying to give a summary description of Jesus, why would you say that his self-sacrificial living, which reaches its climax in the cross, why does that have any bearing on all things in heaven and on earth? I thought salvation was just for people. And here we're told, no, it's for everything, every creature, the microbes in the soil, too. And the answer to the question, why, is because it's all the expression of God's love in the first place. God has no desire to see anything created be destroyed, which is why the Left Behind series books are a theological catastrophe. God does not ever delight in the destruction of any creaturely life because the creature, first and foremost, is God's love made physical. You don't destroy what you love. And so the scriptures that begin with the God on God's knees, hands in the dirt, kissing the soil, ends with a remarkable vision. A lot of Christians that I grew up with, and for a time I myself believed that the point of faith is to get your soul to heaven. And wherever heaven is, it's not here. So heaven means getting away. But how does scripture end in Revelation? 
Does it end with souls taking off to go somewhere else? Wherever somewhere else is, because God's certainly not here. No. Because we're told in this most remarkable vision that rather than us going up to go meet with God, God is still always only ever Emmanuel. God is coming to be with us. And so we are told that the home of God is among mortals. We're not going away from earth to be with God. God is coming to earth to be with us and to redeem all of it. And we're given a description of the heavenly city where there will be no more hunger. There will be no more violence, no more war. There will be a tree of life for healing, for the feeding of all the nations. It's food again. Because food is the medium of love. It's the means of hospitality. It's the means whereby we welcome each other, we receive each other, we come to understand each other, we nurture each other. And in doing those kinds of things, we make possible for a liberated life. A life that might, if we get lucky, and if we give all of our love to it, that might result in flourishing. I think that's a pretty amazing vision. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Wurzba, for the edifying and inspiring remarks. I uh, Not only do you, you say uh, profound and provocative things, but you say it in a particularly eloquent and faith-filled way. So thank you so much. Uh, let's turn to a uh, brief commentary, just a few minutes, from each of our panelists, because we want to make sure we have time for a question and answer. And we'll hear first from Jim Ennis. I mentioned he was the executive director of Catholic Rural Life. Uh, that's a non-Catholic profit, uh, non-profit organization. Catholic, <laughs> non-profit, not non-Catholic. <laughs> okay. Good thing we're not doing this live. Uh, a, a Catholic non-profit organization serving the rural church in the United States for over 95 years, developing rural leaders through education, advocacy, and outreach programs. He's also president of the International Catholic Rural Association based out of Rome. He's an adjunct professor at the University of St. Thomas. I have the privilege of team teaching him with our uh, rural ministry program and our uh, seminarians at the major seminary. He speaks around the world on issues of faith, food, and the environment, and the noble vocation of agricultural leadership. A co-author of a document, Vocation of Agricultural Leader, that was presented to Pro Pro Pope Francis in December 10, 2016. I think that, that's pretty impressive. There's more to say, but that's pretty impressive. Uh, let's hear from Jim. Uh, yeah, yeah, probably. Maybe you could. Well, thank you, Christopher. He is a board member, so I'm, I'm glad he got our mission right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are a Catholic organization. Um, our organization was founded in 1923 by a farmer. Some, by Father Edwin V. O'Hara. He actually graduated from the St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity in 1905. And he had a passion for rural life. He was called to Portland, Oregon, where he served in the Diocese of Portland. But eventually he got permission from the bishop to start up a Catholic organization that would reach out to rural communities, both to evangelize, but also to bring the chur church's social teachings into the rural communities. So our program now focuses on three major areas, um, ethical food and agriculture, rural ministry and outreach, and care of creation. Our organization is national, so we have members in 46 states. We have a national board of directors made up of bishops, priests, men and women religious, theologians like Dr. Thompson, uh, farmers, and other lay men and women who help support the mission of our organization. We're based here at the University of St. Thomas. So we came back to our roots. We were in Des Moines, Iowa for many, many years, and we moved here in 2014. But I, I want to just touch on some of the 
things that um, Dr. Wiersbuth mentioned. Uh, I, I just cannot tell you what joy it is to be in the same room with him. I've read his work for many years, and now to be here. And uh, there's just so much more in his books, like on food and faith, that I would encourage you to look at and take a look at. Catholic Rural Life has a program called Eating is a Moral Act. And it's a program that is based off a, a writer named Wendell Berry who wrote in one of his essays that eating is an agricultural act because he was talking about there's this relationship between farmers and all those involved in agriculture and providing food for our tables. When we eat, we're not eating alone, but as Dr. Wiersba so eloquently said, we're also dependent upon all those farmers. And so um, Pope Francis wrote a very uh, important letter in 2015. It was called Laudato Si, Praise Be, on care of our common home. And he wrote it because he saw from uh, the world perspective what was happening to our common home. And the concern was that through sin in our own lives that man had uh, broken relationships in three ways. Our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, but also our relationship with creation. And he focused this letter on a right relationship to creation, as Dr. Wiersba talked about. And so when we, um, Christopher and I, were working on this uh, project called the vocation of the agricultural leader, the seeds of it came in 2011. We were in Stockton, California, presenting to all these farmers in the San Joaquin Valley, where I grew up. And the San Joaquin Valley has all kinds of challenges with high nitrate levels in, uh, in soil and in uh, groundwater and surface water. Nitrates caused by fertilization, uh, fer heavy fertilization, also manures. And we have the problem in Iowa, and this Minnesota, New York, Ohio. And I had Chris talk about right relationships to the land, faith, food, and the environment. We had the Commissioner of Agriculture there for California, and we had about 75 people, about 40 were farmers. I had five farmers come up to me afterwards and say, Jim, where did you get this guy? We've been farming all our lives. We grew up in the Catholic Church. We've never heard this message on right relationships to the land. All we're are about is commodity agriculture. We're just trying to raise corn, soybeans, grapes, cotton, uh, all kinds of crops in the Central Valley of California. They're under so much pressure, so thin margins. It's so difficult to be a farmer today that it's all business. And what's happened is we've lost the values and the meaning behind agriculture production. And that's why we, we uh, created this document, Vocation of the Agricultural Leader, to retrieve the sense of this noble vocation. An ancient pre-lapsarian, as Dr. Thompson would use it, pre-fall vocation to tend and to till, and how important it is. And so we've, we've been uh, speaking to farmers all across the country and, and internationally as well uh, on this noble vocation. And we were able to present to Pope Francis, as Christopher said, and we've been working with the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace and several other departments in the Vatican to share this message across the world. Because we need a next generation of men and women who are inspired by faith to be farmers, that it's a noble vocation. Another project that I just want to highlight uh, a little bit is, is on this why eating is a moral act and, and reconnecting men and women who are in, rural, in urban communities with where their food comes from and why it's so important. And so we've been, I've been doing talks around the country uh, at, ca at Catholic uh, universities, at land-grant universities, and I get this comment many times from students who are listening. They go, okay, we hear this message. We're, we are passionate about our faith. What can we do in the urban areas? And there are four things I want you to think about that we talk about often. One is is a reconciliation with our creator and to be reconciled to God. And God has gifted us by giving us both life but also giving us the, the cross. The, the, through the death and resurrection of Christ, he's given us a gift that we can receive. And when we receive that, we receive his Holy Spirit who then gives us an ability to see, to see beyond just the natural but the supernatural, to see the gift of life and life to the full. The second thing is to take a, take a look at how we live our life with one another. 
And as we look at life and we look at creation as a gift, we start caring for it in a whole different manner. It makes all the difference in the world. And so to see both um, the creation and each other as gifts, it'll change the way that we look at our lawns, our yards, um, and, and we begin to think about how we care for it. The third thing is, is as consumers, we all eat. We all purchase food. We can talk to our grocer. Do you support your local farmers when, the, when, it's, when it's in season? Do you know how many apple orchards we have in Minnesota? Anybody? Over 200. We have a great variety of apples, wonderful apples. And in Wisconsin, too, in Michigan, many, there are so many wonderful apples. And we can, you can talk to your local grocers. Talk to your local chefs about sourcing local foods. These are different creative ways to uh, support local agriculture when possible, to support farmers and to provide that income and keep it local when possible. And, and finally, it's as, as we look at the care of creation, is to continue to uh, be good stewards and do something. For instance, start a garden. Maybe have a plant in your apartment. Uh, maybe start raising chickens. Uh, I started that a year ago, and it's been, it's been a mind-blowing experience. These six hens, we're like this now. And <laughs> <laughs> they're like little, they're so happy when I get home because they know where the food comes from. And so, and we get six eggs a day. But, I mean, these are the kinds of little practical things that you start seeing how, as Dr. Weersma said, how plants grow, how they, uh, what kinds of needs they have, and what's happening. You know, I've got this white mildew on our pumpkin leaves. I'm going, what the heck is this? And I had to go on YouTube and find out. You know, so you, you do all kinds of research, but it's, 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 a, it's giving you attention to the land. There are a whole bunch of other ideas. We have a national magazine. You can learn more about our organization, how we promote this. We have members all over the country. Love to have you a member if you have time uh, and you have interest. We've got materials here on the table, um, and I'd love to talk to you afterwards. But thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. And I just want to underscore, he mentioned their offices here on, on campus. Uh, and so he's available for as a resource in your classrooms, resource for your own research and study. Uh, here at St. Thomas. I know he'd, he and his staff would be uh, more than happy to continue the conversation. Part of the reason we assembled the uh, panel that we did is because we wanted to inspire you, the next generation that has to think about these questions, to, to not only uh, uh, enter deeply into the thought of Professor Weirs, but, but then to start practically thinking about, you know, uh, where do I take these new insights and, and what can I do in the community uh, to contribute to some of these questions. Uh, in, in light of that, I, our next speaker will be John Mesco. It says he's a familiar face in the, in the Midwestern agricultural community. He joined the team at Moses in September of 2016. Uh, that's the Midwest Organic Sustainable and Education Services. Prior to that, he headed the Sustainable Farming Association in Minnesota. He has a bachelor's degree in agronomy and a master's in farm management from Purdue. His unique career has covered all facets of agriculture, from his early days in fertilizer sales and biotech research to his current focus on organic and sustainable farming. In each role, he's worked to promote a better understanding and appreciation of how food is produced. He sees farmers as the original caretakers of the environment, one of the reasons we had him here, and strives to bring the food and farming community together to promote farming practices that produce abundant, healthy food in a sustainable manner. With that, John Mesco. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and thank you all for coming, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about our work at Moses and uh, also to reiterate and affirm some of the things we've heard from Dr. Wurzba. I would just share with you briefly that uh, there are two beliefs at the core of why I do this work, two beliefs at the core of why I left a very good position in the conventional ag world, working with biotechnology and uh, uh, conventional farms all across the Midwest, uh, to work in on our own farm uh, here in Minnesota, and also to uh, work with other farmers, helping them to learn and grow about uh, organic and sustainable farming practices. The first of all, uh, first belief that's core uh, to this activity for me is that. I believe God could have made us any way he wanted to. Dr. Wurzba hint, uh, hinted at this. He didn't have to make it so that we ate food. 
uh, or that we had to interact with the soil or animals. He could have made any way he wanted to. Could have made it so we get it from the sun. Could have made it so we get it when we, after we walk 10,000 steps. All of a sudden, that's all we need. But he chose to do it the way he did, and we have to discover the impact of that. We have to live our lives to discover the impact and the benefit of that. And the second thing is, I believe that when he said, fill the earth, that he wasn't secretly withholding the knowledge that at some point, before the earth gets filled, we're going to run out of resources. I don't believe we're full. If you fly from New York to L.A. or from here to L.A., from here anywhere, uh, you can look out the window of the plane and see the earth is not full. <laughs> Nowhere close to full. My wife, Lisa, is here with me tonight, and we just returned from Beijing, China. It's full there. <laughs> it's, it's very full there. But it's not full all over China. Uh, and, and they're working over there. One of the things we did while we were there is to talk about how to uh, maximize the productivity of their soils. Uh, so we have not filled the earth, and I don't believe that God put us here and then is going to pull the plug on those resources before we finish that work. So I think we've just begun to scratch the surface of the productivity of our earth, and uh, it is bound up in our understanding of communities and relationships. Uh, Dr. Wurzba talked about uh, food leading to a discussion about our, uh, within our families. That's a community. And what that means as we uh, share our love with one another through the production and sharing and, and feeding of each other, uh, that's a, a community. Those are relationships. Those are strengthening bonds that help us understand uh, why we're here and our role here on this earth. Um, the practices that we teach in our organization, the farming practices that we advocate for, are organic, they are sustainable and regenerative. What I mean by that is we seek to uh, shepherd the natural systems that our first farmer put in place here for us to learn and to expand the productivity. So we have many examples of farmers that I work with all across the country where we've seen the uh, productivity of their soil skyrocket as soon as they quit tilling and using pesticides and, and using uh, commercial fertilizers and increase the interaction of livestock, uh, row crops, cover crops, uh, intensive grazing management. We see their productivity skyrocket and the capacity for our soils to feed us, again, I think has only scratched the surface. Uh, at our organization, we have an annual conference every year in February. It's held in La Crosse, Wisconsin. We have about 3,500 people come every year. 65 workshops, uh, and this coming year is our 30th annual conference. We've been doing this for a long time. We are the largest event of its kind in the United States, and as I mentioned, uh, Lisa and I just came back from China. They are bringing me there, bringing our organization there to learn about how they can do those kinds of educational opportunities there. Um, we are seeing the single largest uh, growth of attendance in our conference from conventional farmers. Farmers who are just like what you see on TV, corn, soybeans, and chemicals, and fertilizers. Those folks are increasing in number at our event because they see the dead end of the farming uh, practices that they're using. Here's the challenge, and this is why I want to share with you about community. If you think about what it takes for somebody to change completely the practices of their farm. What it really involves, it's not hard to quit using these products and start using these practices and, and quit using that material and begin using this. That's not hard to do that. What's really hard for people is to have to change their relationships. You know, conventional farmers have churchgoers that they go to church with. They have people that they buy their products from. They have people that they sell their products to. They have all these relationships of people that they deal with every day to do their work. And when we say to them, well, you don't really need to buy all that stuff. <laughs> you know, you really ought to think about doing this. You know, you actually don't need to farm 10,000 acres. You could probably scale it way back, have somebody else farm half that, increase the jobs in your community, restore the community of your rural area, and you could farm a small. What we're asking them to change their relationships. And it's really hard. You talk to anybody 
who makes a significant change like that, and I'll tell you, the biggest single hurdle is I had to give up my relationship with these people, and I had to establish relationships with these people, and that's a challenge. We do that at our event in La Crosse. That's a big part of what we do. We have uh, uh, networking sessions. We have 3,500 people come to a, a relatively small community, and we have a lot of intentional networking and community building there. Our organization also hosts uh, events throughout the year that are tied to that conference. Maybe a farmer that presents at that conference will host a field day later in the year or in the summer. And that's building community and networks, and that's really the core of what we do. These communities are people. These communities are uh, soil and soil bacteria. These communities are plants. Uh, this is an important piece of what we're doing, and they're at their peak are synergistic. When everything's fitting together, they are synergistic, and God created a system that naturally wants to go that way. And what we've done is said, no, we got to go this way. And the system keeps wanting to go that way. And we keep trying to pull it back this way. If you just let a piece of land sit vacant, you can see what happens. Uh, so I would share that with you. I would encourage you to uh, engage, just as you've heard here, in an opportunity to try something, uh, grow some plants, grow some of your own food, Become a little bit more involved with the relationships between yourself and uh, the earth that you have to work with. And if you have questions or you'd like to learn more about the kind of work that we're doing at Moses, our website is mosesorganic.org. Thank you. And, and what's the date of your conference? In February 21st through the 25th. In La Crosse, Wisconsin. Several thousand organic farmers. If you're interested in maybe exploring that, you know, get a carpool of your friends and go down to La Crosse and have a fun weekend uh, checking out the, the world of organic farm. It's really a, really a very inspiring, uh, and frankly, to see all the green and all the growing and all the possibilities in the middle of winter kind of lifts the soul a little bit too. So, so it's good. It's a wonderful time. Uh, talking of relationships, we're going to hand it off to our local um, uh, psychologist, uh, Elise Amel, has a PhD in industrial organizational psychology from Purdue, again, and has been teaching at the University of St. Thomas since 77. Doctor, 1977. Wow. Wow. I'll get better. Uh, since 1977. I won't get better. <laughs> uh, sorry, folks. Uh, tiny print here. Dr. Amel, I'm going to just quit here after a couple <laughs> sentences. Dr. Amel is an award-winning professor of psychology, past director of environmental studies, past president for the Society of Environmental Population and Conservation Psych Psychology, and is a fellow of the American Psychological Association. She recently co-authored an article in science magazine, I suppose, about the role of psychology in addressing environmental crises, and a textbook, Psychology for Sustainability. So I was thinking about, John, your comments on relationship. Maybe Elise has something to offer along that line. Anyway, let's listen, let's listen and welcome <laughs> Dr. Amy. Oh, thank you so much. This is so exciting to see how many of you are out there um, just thinking about this. It's fantastic. So um, I, I would like to put tonight's discussion in context of what is going on at St. Thomas. Uh, food is really important to sustainability, not just because we all do it every day, but because um, it touches on all the facets of, in, of sustainability from air quality and water quality and toxicants and energy and climate change. It's all wrapped up in what we choose to eat and how we choose to procure that food. And, um, and so this conversation is really important as St. Thomas moves to become a, a sustainable place. And recently, our president, Dr. Julie Sullivan, um, wrote some, some fine words that in incorporated uh, the Pope's encyclical um, and his focus on uh, care for creation and, and really urged us to work together uh, to care for our common home, um, as put by 
Pope Francis and uh, really called on us to embrace this call here at St. Thomas. Um, she goes on to say that sustainability is core to our mission of advancing the common good. And, um, and what I think is really important in her quote was saying, this is not the job of one person, this is a job for all of us. We all play a role. And uh, so this means infusing sustainability in our academic programs, our student life, facilities, operations, public engagement, and all of our administrative functions. Um, so about 12 years ago, all sorts of grassroots stuff came bubbling up here at St. Thomas, everything from a stewardship science garden uh, where students um, engage both in the scientific inquiry of, of good soil and um, organic practices, but also um, taking that f that uh, garden and making community out of it and making sure that, that, that fresh food goes to people who don't ordinarily um, have access to it and you know it had all these really great um, features to it very um, uh, uh, very cool movement going on on campus and we now have pollinator paths and we've spent a lot of time on our curriculum trying to to infuse sustainability throughout the, the different disciplines and think about how food can um, be engaged uh, across different disciplines I mean it, it can be part of the conversation in ecology, in economics, in sociology, in family studies, in, you know, marketing and English. And, you know, these are all very productive places to talk about our choices and where we want, where we see ourselves being in 5, 10, 50, 500 years, you know. We're, we're making those plans now. So we need to actually have skilled leaders in this area. And so right now, St. Thomas has um, a grant that is aimed at trying to um, create a sustainability culture that prepares student leaders. And um, so I think it's really important to acknowledge that every single one of us can be a leader. We all have a sphere of influence that we, we walk in every day. And um, so part of being a leader is identifying um, our, our role, what we know, learning, learning about food and its impacts, and then um, doing what Jim and John have suggested, you know, gro growing a little bit of your own food and um, be growing your expertise so that you can share your ideas with other people. So leadership, um, really transformational leadership, is empowering other people. Um, and so I think it's um, really critical with this new movement on campus to engage, you know, faculty, staff, students um, in all areas of work and all disciplines of inquiry and um, to inspire and empower others. So I, I, in addition to learning more about food yourself, I really would like to challenge all of you to take it the next step and draw on your superpowers. We all ha can draw on a variety of different powers. Um, some of us have um, formal leadership roles. Others are more informal leaders. Um, but we can build our expertise create trusting relationships, there's where the relationships come in, um, build respect uh, among our peers and then make sure we sit down at a meal and um, share what we know so that we transfer what, what we've learned to others and really make a big impact. Thanks, Elise. I really like what she said, especially th about this notion of leadership. Really excited to see uh, so many students here and invite you to uh, examine your conscience and in your prayer and in your reflection at the end of the day today, you know, just ask yourself, maybe, maybe God is asking me to step forward in this way. Maybe there's some questions or issues that I would like to pursue. Uh, this is a big, complicated uh, topic, and none of us uh, have all of the answers. Uh, I'm sure there were some questions you might have, and you'll get a chance to ask them in a minute. 
Uh, if it doesn't come up tonight or you don't feel comfortable asking in this venue, then feel free to write any of us. Uh, I think you can see we're all relatively friendly people, huh? These guys for sure. And uh, uh, you, can, you can write us and contact us if there's something you want to explore further. I really want to encourage that. Elise is right about uh, uh, leadership. When we were working with uh, Jim and I on this document, the vocation of the agricultural leader, we were all over the world. We were in Rome. We were in Zambia. We were with French organic farmers. We were in California with the grape growers. Uh, I've spoken in Alaska, in Honduras, in Quebec, in Scotland, uh, on, to all kinds of folks. The one word that tripped us up in so much of our conversation was the word leader. Uh, the document was in French and Italian and Tagalog, a, a Philippine, uh, a, a language of the Philippines. Uh, and the one word that sort of tripped the community up was that word leadership because we, so many people would read it and say, well, that's not me. This must be for somebody else. So we've, we, we, you've touched on an important nerve there to say, no, uh, you are the leaders. Uh, you, it is your time to step forward and, and, and serve, and we hope this encourages you. Okay. Uh, the floor is open. We have, are we doing the roving mics, Sean? Yes. yes. They're right here. I think I'm going to turn that on. There's one. This and here's another. If you don't really want to use a mic and you just think you'd shout it out, that's fine too. Questions or comments? Norman, you want to come up? Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, I've been thinking about the relationship between food and community uh, a lot. And uh, one of the things I've been thinking about or just, uh, I guess, observing is thinking about the rise of kind of fast food and quick cooking like TV dinners and hamburger helper and that uh, over throughout kind of the, the 20th century uh, alongside some of the social issues such as the rise in divorce rates uh, 18 to 24 year olds are now the loneliest age group uh, in the world. And just thinking about some of those things in relationship to uh, you know, the, the quick access we have to food that completely detaches us from the source of that food. So I was wondering if you had any commentary upon that. Okay, there's a lot to say. <laughs> um, I want to recommend a book to you by a friend of mine, Robin Kimmerer. Have you, any of you heard of her? She is a Native American woman, botanist, teaches in upstate New York. She wrote a book called Braiding Sweetgrass. It's absolutely fabulous. In the book, she says something that is incredibly profound. She says human beings need to know that they live in a place where love is made manifest to them. Because we know that if people grow up in a context where they don't feel love, everything goes badly. And people will develop all kinds of compensatory strategies that will take really weird, often destructive turns. And so it's absolutely crucial that people have a world in which they live where they feel love. Now obviously we will say that starts in the family, in the home, and absolutely. But what she says in the book, which was just mind-blowing to me, is she says it has to extend to the land. Because if you don't feel loved by the land, he says, she says, think about what that means for you. It means, first of all, that you don't belong here. But she says, from an indigenous point of view, as someone who gardens, as someone who hunts and gathers, your experience, your embodied experience, your taste bud experience is of a world that loves you because it's providing for you, it nurtures you, and it wants you to live well. And she says, when she thinks about how you know, colonists, imperialists came and took the land and had a radically different understanding of the land simply as private property and the commodification of land, what that did she said, besides leading to this idea that we can commodify all living things, including people, eventually, what that led to is us being unable to know how much the land loves us. 
And she says, we in our culture, our economies, our cultures are in so many ways compensatory strategies. And so we're not going to live well until we learn how to love the land so that we can experience back to ourselves the love it has for us. And I want to just tell you a little story that, I, I, that, that makes this really powerful. A couple years ago, I was in Alberta giving a talk, and um, an, an older man came up to me. His name is Dan. He says, I farm about three hours away from here, and my family's big farm. I farm with two brothers. We have thousands of acres, all commodity crops. He said, I started to feel in my body that something wasn't right, and he started to develop gastrointestinal troubles. And it was terrible. Couldn't figure out what it was. Doctors were trying all kinds of medications on him, tried different diets. Nothing was working. Until one day he read something. I don't know where it was. But it said, there's a relationship between you and your land and you and your body. If you're putting poison on your land, you're putting poison in yourself. And that hit him like a freight train, he said. And so he tried to learn more and more about regenerative agriculture. And the more he learned, the more he realized it's absolutely the way we have to go. You were talking about this, John. So he decided that he was going to stop the use of monoculture farming with all the pesticides, all the plowing, all the implements, all that. He was going to stop it. And his brothers were furious with him. They said, you can't. You'll go bankrupt. And he said, this is my land. It's a family farm. You got your sections. I got my sections. I'm going to do this. I need to heal the land before I can heal my own body. And so he did. It took several years. And he said that one day he was out in his field. He had planted trees, brought back grasses. He said suddenly all the lives of the animals came back. Birds, butterflies, worms, all of it was there. And he said he sat down in the field one day and he just started crying like a baby. And he said, the reason I was crying is, he says, that was the day the land forgave me. And I said, Dan, what do you mean the land forgave you? The land doesn't do that. And he said, my land forgave me. And he said, until the land forgave me, I couldn't learn to live. It's an incredible story, but it's all about relationships to a place relationships to your own body. Think about what we do to our bodies and how the relationships we have with land that are distorted are going to result in distorted relationships in all sorts of other areas at the same time. <coughs> so yeah, the loneliness, it's a part of the sickness of our culture which wants to poison everything. That's just one part of it. Do you all want to say anything? We have a an esteemed psychologist right here. Rituals are really important for healthy people and healthy relationships. And um, so if you think about meals as a really important ritual, I, I think if you look at the literature, um, kids who share a family meal um, regularly um, tend to be more well-adjusted, that kind of thing. So I think uh, the the fast food and um, and the outcomes that you're talking about um, can somewhat be explained by sort of the lack of ritual involved with eating without being mindful. Good evening. Um, I live in the Phillips neighborhood in Minneapolis, and one thing that's been on our minds over the last basically over summer, has been our, uh, our precious tent city down the street from us, uh, which has me, you brought up private property, <coughs> um, and I've been thinking a lot more lately about the idea of the struggle that our cities have between private property, which is an ancient, uh, even Thomas himself uh, detailing about private property, but also struggling against common use about our, we are created with the earth. And we have a sort of inherent right to gain our life and our living, our food, our sustenance from the earth, uh, being mutually created with it. Uh, and 
I'm wondering, how do you struggle with that tension between private property and common use, especially in our cities? I think the first thing to note is that the laws around private property have been incredibly diverse through time in different places, even in this country. You know, there are times in the 19th century where the pendulum, if you want to think about private property as, okay, somebody owns the land, but they have to pay a, a lot of attention to other people and how your land use affects others, so that's one side. And the other side is, I can do whatever the heck I want with it because it's my land, okay? So you got those two extremes. The pendulum has moved back and forth on this quite a lot, and we now happen to be on this side of the extreme, where people think that if I own it, I can do with it whatever I want. But it has been written into the law in different states in the 19th century, where farmers, people who owned forest areas, they could not do with the land whatever they wanted to because people lived upstream, downstream, in the area, whatever. Couldn't do it. So I think that's the first thing to note. We think sometimes that private property is one thing. It's not. We should be able to have conversations about what does private property require of you in the way of responsibilities for others. Right? That's a difficult conversation to have in our particular context, but it's one that I think we should open up. And I think I would give just one sort of theological way to, to maybe open up this question. You're absolutely right that from a biblical point of view, People having access to land is central to their possible thriving because the soil, the land, is the place from which we draw our sustenance. And that's one of the reasons, I think, that you see within the Sabbath code, this teaching called Jubilee. First of all, it's preceded by the idea that the land is a member of Sabbath code so that it's not just people who get to rest, but the animals get to rest. The land gets to rest, too, because... I know this is tricky to argue, but you could make the argument the land is an agent in the Bible, right? God speaks through the land, and the land has a relationship with God, and the land has a relationship with us. And so it's very important that the land be heard, that the land be taken care of, and that when we take care of the land and take care of each other, we're actually participating in this sort of triangular relationship of God, land, and people all together. And so the Sabbath has this thing called Jubilee, which was that if people were for some reason, misfortune, bad planning, whatever, to lose their land, they have to sell it. After 50 years, the land goes back to families so that nobody is in a position where they can accumulate land at the expense of others. So there's this conception that the land is never something that people own outright, Right? And it says this exactly in Scripture. The land is mine. But the idea is that people need to have access to the land. And so when thinking about private property, there's this question about, yes, you have some sort of right over the land to do with it certain kinds of things, but does that right ever override a common need that people might have to sometimes be able to access that land for their own sustenance? That's a conversation that I think is worth having. I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, it's not necessarily a, a theological perspective on this, but one of the things that uh, we met a, a professor in China who's working on this. There are a number of folks uh, working on this in the U.S., and that is tying the value of farming practices to the value of the land. So I the ecosystem services provided by a diversified, um, intensively managed grazing system far outweigh the ecosystem services of a row crop uh, corn soybean rotation. So if we could tie that to the value of the land, if we could tie the value of the soil health, the, the, the amount of carbon that gets sequestered by a particular soil, if we could tie that to the value of the land instead of what we have today, which is the value of the land is based on how many bushels of corn it can produce or how close it is to a railroad to load it up to the to, to load the corn up. So we have a we have a, a real uh, disconnection as to how we value land. And there's a, a lot of ag economists, there's a lot of agronomists that are working together to, to think about what is the value of land? Is it just for a place to put seeds and chemicals and then pull some some crops out, some commodities? Or is it to 
service our entire uh, our globe and our entire existence. Uh, just one more comment on that. Uh, we work with parishes all over the country and churches who are, a lot of them have some a lot of property, and they're starting to use the land to actually grow food. And the, the intention is to provide it to local food shelves and also to those in need. And like that encampment you're speaking about near Phillips neighborhood and others, you know, where there's, there's some fo uh, serious food insecurity and, and, and homelessness as well. So there are issues around how do we share food. And so churches are doing some really interesting models around the country to address that both in rural and urban communities that I think is again a model that can be very practical and, in, 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 and involve lots of, of the congregation and think creatively how, to, how can I feed others. I'm so glad you said that, Jim, because in my part of the world, when I talk with folks, it's often young people that want to do farming, but land prices are ridiculous, and they could never think about owning a piece of land. But if we've got faith communities that do own land, wouldn't it be fabulous if churches and mosques were to say, we're going to make our property available for young people, who, or any age people, who want to grow food for the community? That would be amazing. Christopher says we have time for one more question. Thank you very much. So one of my favorite farmers has a saying, um, times are urgent, let's slow down. And the solutions that I hear you all talking <coughs> about in terms of healing the land and healing relationships are things that take a long time time. And yet we live in this moment when the climate crisis is very urgent, we're losing soil, the UN has even said that we may only be able to produce food for 60 more years if we continue on the path that we're on. So how do you reconcile that sense that s the solution is a slow one with the times in which we live? I would just say uh, a couple things. I'll don't ever assume that what you're hearing is correct. So challenge everything. So first of all, I don't think it's all that slow. Um, has anybody heard of a farmer in North Dakota named Gabe Brown? Somebody knows Gabe Brown. Okay. Uh, he's building topsoil at the rate of probably two to, two to three inches every five years. And we've all been told that you need 50 million years to grow an inch of topsoil. And you need six months to destroy an inch of topsoil, okay? So it's really happening in Bismarck, North Dakota with 11 inches of rainfall a year. It's really happening, and you can go there and you can see it. So when you hear people say, oh, we're going to hell in a handbasket, you can go somewhere and you can see it's not happening that way. So uh, that's, that's one thing. So I don't think it's going to take that long. I, I think I challenge that assumption. And then the second thing is, Every journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. It's, it doesn't matter how long it takes. You got to start now. I think I would also say just be prepared for surprise. <laughs> right? The the folks that make the predictions, there's a presumption that they already know the outcome, and I don't think any of us know the outcomes because we're dealing with things that we have barely begun to understand. So one of my friends at Duke is Dan Richter, who is a leading soil scientist and is part of the str stratigraphic commission that's trying to determine whether there's an Anthropocene epoch that we are now in. He's big time. I sat down with him for lunch one day. I said, Dan, tell me that soil can sequester carbon at whatever rate that people are saying, and that could be a major solution to climate change problems. He said, Norm, I'd love to be able to tell you that. He says, but we don't have a foggy idea what soil does yet. And I said, wait a minute, you are the man <laughs> who knows about how soil systems work. He says, yeah, we do all kinds of measures, but we still don't know how does what's going on eight feet below the topsoil relate to what's going on in the top foot? How do weather systems affect what's going on in the top foot? How have the historical patterns of settlement affected that top foot? He says, we know next to nothing. I said, you just depressed me. He said, no, it gives us hope <laughs> because it means we really don't yet know what the soil is even capable of. So he says, just get busy, love. 
and just, you know, be smart. Don't be stupid. But he said, put your love to work, and we just don't know what's going to happen. And I think that's a really hopeful thing to say. If I could just add that, you know, where we are today is the cumulative effect of all of us as individuals. And so um, the, the power of change is in all of us, the cumulative effect of all of us as individuals. And so um, it's important to, to really leverage your relationships. And I'm going to say it again, it's important to lead. <laughs> it's important to take what you're learning and share it um, so that um, it's not just up to a few people to try and um, carry the load of, of what's ahead of us. You know, we, we all need to be in it together. So. And I also think uh, Mother Teresa, St. Teresa of Calcutta, is a great example of how she addressed poverty. And you go, it's so overwhelming. You know, it doesn't matter. It's just like me throwing a rock in the ocean. What it won't even make a difference. And she goes, no, no, no. Actually, start by just helping the person, your neighbor, helping someone you see in need. And I think it, it is, it's a change of mind, a change of understanding that we have to be transformed inside ourselves first. But we all have different spheres of influence. And, you know, this kid at from Bakersfield, California, you know, my friends still go, what the heck do you do? You know, and, and I tell them about the environmental, and they start shaking their heads. They're going, N you know, it, it, it's, it's taken them about 20 years to try to understand what I'm doing for a living. And um, thankfully, they still love me. And I, we had a high school reunion last month, and it was we had a really good time together. But th my, my point is that don't lose heart, but, but as you see things, especially the younger generation in this room, you, you have a chance to make a huge difference. And I mean, it starts with simple things, yes. But those simple things start building on and they start compounding and you have your networks of friends and relatives, et cetera. And that that's can really make a, 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 a significant social change. And I think that's, we have, but we have to see the land as gift and treasure it and honor it and really uh, recognize the, the, the generosity of our creator. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you to all, all of you. I, I, it's pretty much an abundance of, wi of wisdom here, wise people speaking uh, on important topics. I, we're very, very blessed to have everyone here. Uh, it's Feast of Francis. Let's just uh, maybe um, express our, our gratitude for our guests and, and, their, and their common uh, uh, gifts and sharing them with us. And maybe we just uh, uh, s sing a little song together to close out the evening. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Thanks everybody, have a good evening.